Today, Nikon's Retro ZF. I'm gonna share what I love about it, what I wish was a little bit different, I'll give you my full rants and raves, plus some tips and tricks for using it, as well as the accessories I think are essential for it. Well, hey everyone, it's Hudson. Welcome to this week's video. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about Nikon ZF, a controversial camera that I personally love. Uh, and we'll, I'll give you a whole list of things that I love about it, and also things that I wish were different. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about why some people were sort of disappointed uh, when it released. And I've heard from people who love it and people who were disappointed. Before we do that, a couple quick announcements, a couple related to the ZF. One is that I'm launching the full setup video. It's a long video we walk through all the critical menu settings and how I've set this camera up to really function at its best for me after spending the last month with it through Scotland and you know all over the place firing several thousand frames through it. And that full video is linked right here. It's also in this video's full description. Um, along with that video, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be pointing out a bunch of accessories that I think are good to use with this camera, a couple of which I think are critical to use with this camera. Um, and those are linked in this video's full description if you click the title or show more, or they're over at my ATS links page, hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links. You can click right here again. Uh, and you know, using those links helps me out and I appreciate when you do it. Uh, you know, the, the other announcement is we're doing our office hours, December 5th, the big free photography meetup get together on Zoom and YouTube Live, December 5th, this Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific, and we're looking through your best images of 2023. And we'll give a few free things out to people whose images we think really, really stand out. Uh, so if you haven't signed up and submitted an image, please run over to hudsonhenry.com slash office hours. Again, you can click right here or down in the video's full description and, and sign up, choose your platform of choice and submit an image. I'm really looking forward to going through everybody's images this Tuesday. It'll be Rick and, and David and Darren and Woody and I, and you know it, it's gonna be fun, kind of a year-end celebration of everybody's creativity this year. All right, let's talk ZF stuff. Oh, one final thing, along with the full setup guide, if you go over to that video, you're gonna find that I'm sharing, uh, for the first time in a Nikon camera, the bin file with my settings. A lot of people always ask me, uh, and Z8, Z9, some of the other cameras with user modes and banks, it's a little complicated. This camera is a little bit, a little bit easier, still is a bit complex, so uh, with a couple of changes, like getting rid of my copyright information and a couple of the custom button assignment swaps, I'm putting that BIM file out. You can get to it from my setup video, which I linked a little bit ago or is down in the full description. All right, let's talk about really fast. Well, I'll run through uh, the pros and cons, things that I love about this camera, things that I don't love so much. Uh, and, then, and then I'll go, we'll look at some images from it and then I'll finish up looking at some accessories that I think are just awesome for it. Um, and you know, I guess, one of the primary things that's different about this camera and that I personally love about it is the look and feel of it. You know, it, it really truly looks like an old FE or FM camera from the film days, which many of us used and loved. When I sold my FM3A, it just kind of hurt. You know, I got, I got money out of it, but then every now and then I still go on eBay and look. <laughs> Even though I don't care to shoot film, I just loved that camera and I loved it with some of these classic old Nikon manual focus AIS lenses like this uh, 105 2.5 portrait lens from back in the day. Um, so this camera looks and feels and is built rugged like those cameras. Nikon's done some other retro designed cameras in the digital age that I don't think hit the mark as well. This one has that, that solid feel, that look and the brass dials so that as it ages they'll brass out just the whole thing from an aesthetic and user standpoint, for those of us who use those old cameras, is wonderful. And I think it'll attract a whole generation of young people who love cameras like Fuji has been building with the retro design aesthetic. It's really, really wonderful. And it blends some of the best of both worlds. I'll talk about the controls on this just a little bit. You've got one custom function button. I wish there was two, but there are just one here. We'll talk about the rants and raves in a minute. 
You got your, your lens release button over on the other side, retro style, nice. On the left side here, we've got access ports for power delivery capable USB-C. We got a headphone jack, a microphone jack for monitoring audio and recording audio. And we've got HDMI, a micro HDMI port. It has a complete articulating screen, which I personally love. I know it divides people's loyalties. I think it's wonderful. You can hold the camera up. Even, I'll show you an L-bracket solution in a minute that still allows me to shoot low with it, allows me to shoot high with it, allows me to turn it around and protect the screen when I'm hiking through rough terrain. I actually broke my z 7 II screen the third day I had it when it bounced against a rock while it was on my side. Having this protects that delicate screen surface. Um, you know, it also allows people to do selfie work where they can see themselves if they're filming or shooting selfie images. I just love the protection of flipping it around backwards. It still lets you operate it just like a normal camera. The back, we've got a normal set of controls. There's a couple funky things about the button layout I'll talk about that I'm not so happy about. They put the play button back up at the top left. That's changeable, but I'll talk about it in a second. On the top, We've got a mode selector, manual, auto, aperture priority, shutter priority, program, or auto. I leave it in manual almost the entire time. And we've got an ISO dial with a C on it. Man, it took me a while. What does C stand for? Um, made some funny jokes about that in Scotland. You can twist it at will once you're into the ISO settings, you know, 100, 200, and thirds of a stop, all the way up to 51,200. But if you go into C, it locks in. C is for command wheel. So you can operate it just like you would a traditional Z camera with the command dials. It has front and rear command dials. Sadly, there's no ISO button, but I figured a workaround for that. I just reprogrammed, if you go into my settings, the video record button to be ISO. It's near the place that most Nikon cameras have ISO. So the video record button, if I press and hold that, I can change ISO with the C setting, the command dial setting, with the back dial and turn auto ISO on and off with the front command dial, click, click, on, off. So that works for that. It has a shutter speed dial like an old school camera that goes from 8,000th of a second down to bulb uh, or time or X, but it also has this green marked one third step. And what that is, is command dial mode. It locks into that one third step. You can't turn it without pressing the button on top. The other modes you can flip around through, but when you get to one third step, it locks in and you have to press the button to pull it out. That's smart. When you're in one third step, you can control it in one third of a stop increments with the command dials just like you would a Z6 or a Z7. It has a little window on the top to show you the aperture when you flip the on switch on near the shutter button. The shutter button is threaded not for a cable release, but for a soft touch button which I screwed one in from the uh, set of three that I got very, very affordably from Amazon that I like on my uh, Leica Q3, and it fit in there beautifully, and it's got a nice feel to pressing that button. Again, the video record button, that's there. I just reprogrammed that to be ISO, and you've got an exposure compensation dial, which I love the hard clicking exposure compensation dial. I like it a lot better than having a button to press. It's easy for me to reach up above the command dial and turn the wheel right above it. Uh, and you get a visual representation when you're looking through the viewfinder or on the screen, right? So, you know, that's, that's the basic uh, control layout. As you can see, it's kind of a hybrid. You can control it just like you would a Z6 or a Z7 if you want. It's 24 megapixels, that's controversial. We're gonna get into, into the rants and raves now about it, really. I think the biggest thing that I, I wish is that it had a few more megapixels. Now, they temper that a little bit with some cool new stuff like pixel shift shooting. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, well, let's go through my list of things that I wish. Wish it was more than 24 megapixels. I think that's the biggest one. That's the most annoying one. It would be great if they had a new sensor to go in it. That being said, the Z6, Z6 II 24 megapixel sensor is a tried and true sensor that's amazing in low light. I set my maximum ISO to 25,600 and I get great results running denoise and Lightroom on images shot up that high at well exposed images. Uh, it has no user modes or banks. I personally think it would be nice if it had a way to program in some user modes, even if it was menu driven. You could put them in the iMenu 
Uh, maybe that's something they could think about in a subsequent firmware version. It'd be nice just to be able to flip from action to still life. Um, you know, the banks are complicated. The user modes aren't perfect in Nikon. You know, I, I feel as if they could really take a look at the way that Leica, and Pro, and, uh, Leica employs profiles on the Q3 camera or the Q2 camera because it's a really smart way. Um, but at any rate, there are none. So it's really important that you set up your iMenu and your My Menu to give you easy access to change settings that you want. And your custom setting button is well thought out. That said, I don't think you buy this camera wanting to shoot sports action and wildlife. This is a camera to use with your old lenses. I'll talk about why in a second when we get to pro. It's a, it's a camera to use thoughtfully. It's a camera to carry with you. It's a, it's a good backup camera to the Z8 or the Z9 if those are your main drivers, but you're going to grab those cameras to shoot wildlife, sports, action. You know, this, this is more of a aesthetically pleasing, retro-designed, amazing low-light, street shooting, everyday family, it's in your bag kind of camera. I don't love that they put the display button down here on the bottom right and the play button back up in the top left. I thought that you know enough of us had complained to Nikon about having to take our hands off of a longer lens to hit play and view what we shot in the viewfinder that they'd learned that it's nicer to just move your thumb down to that button now that we work through a viewfinder that can also display the images and we don't always want to look up from what we're doing. Um, but again, the display button and the play button are programmable. So you know, you'll see in my setup video, I just switched them. Display is play, play is display. You just have to remember that. I wish there was another custom control button. I told it programmable custom button. There's only one. I wish there were two, um, ideally three, but two would work. Uh, when you're using the shutter wheel and you run through the F stops, you know, the, the shutter stops, they're single stops. It's 8,000, 4,000, 2,000, 1,500, 250. When I work with the Leica and you're using the manual controls on the shutter, using the command wheel on the back flips you into the thirds of a stop between. So you can go up two thirds of a stop, down two thirds of a stop from the chosen shutter speed. That would be nice if they employed that here. Here you have to go into one third of a stop to get one third of a stop finite control. And then you got to use the command wheel instead of the cool shutter speed wheel. That's yeah, a nitpicky thing. People are not going to be happy that the second, they put a second memory card in there. That's kind of a pro, but it's a micro SD card, which at first blush, I was like, well, that's not useful at all, except that you know, I, uh, I'll talk in a second here. I've been really impressed when I get to accessories with the micro SD cards that Lexar is making. They are just as fast as an SD card. Now, none of that's going to compare to the Compact Flash Express B cards that those of us shooting the Z9 and the Z8 are, are used to. But these things are pretty darn fast. They're fast enough to shoot the highest quality video that this camera is capable of, uh, even in high dynamic range like, you know, um, N-log and, and hyperlog gamut settings. So it becomes quite useful and they make them up to a terabyte. We'll talk about that with accessories. So the SD card is actually quite, the, the micro SD card is quite useful in addition to the SD card in here. So no super blazing fast cards, but again, like I said, this is not your sports action wildlife choice in camera. It's a more deliberate thought induced shooting experience. Uh, there's a remote control for this that's quite affordable. Uh, it's, it's made by Nikon. It's Bluetooth connected and slightly and somewhat programmable and it lets you basically run this camera from your pocket quite easily. My complaint is that when I connect to it, it makes me disconnect from the SnapBridge app on my phone since both are Bluetooth and it only has one Bluetooth channel. And I just think of the fact that my headphones at this point can connect to my phone, my computer, my tablet, all at the same time and switch seamlessly without me going into menu settings and flipping. And I wish Nikon had been able to get it so that it automatically flips between the wireless remote when I turn it on and my phone so that I don't have to go into the, 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 the settings menu and switch it. Um, it's not a huge thing, but it's small. There's odd mismatches in the menu that feel like holdovers from other cameras, in particular, easy exposure compensation. 
which is if you push the exposure compensation button, you can rotate the command dial and change exposure without holding the button down. But, or even just use the wheel without, but it's kind of funny in a camera with a wheel is the way that you do exposure compensation on the top. So, small. Again, 24 megapixels, 24 megapixels. But, you know, 24 megapixels is, is a wonderful low light machine. You know, if you take a look at the new uh, Sony A9 III, it's so good in low light and so fast handling because of that lower megapixel count. Um, and the other, the other complaint is that while on the pro side, it uses the traditional EN EL15 batteries that we've been using forever now, since before the Z cameras came to market, the sad thing is that once again, like they always do, they nuked compatibility with aftermarket batteries produced before this camera. So all those nice BM aftermarket batteries that work just as well as the Nikons and were a third of the price are useless with this camera. You either gotta buy Nikon batteries or wait for new aftermarket batteries that come out and say ZF compatible. That's, that's just kind of happens every single time, but it's annoying every single time. Let's talk about the things that I love about this camera. I love the build quality, the feel, and the look of this camera. It just, it's like that kind of thing I want to set on my bedside and, and look at and hold in my hand and shoot with. Um, I love its in-body image stabilization. This camera has the best image stabilization that's out there, period. It's, it's certainly the best that Nikon's ever done. It takes it up a level from the Z8 and the Z9. It's eight stops of in-body image stabilization. And I have tested this at 75 millimeters. I handheld a waterfall shot that I'll show you shortly. Uh, and it, it came out sharp, everything except the water. And the funny thing is I've shot a whole bunch at a half a second with waterfalls at different focal lengths. And I shot it in burst mode super carefully. And you would expect to get maybe one sharp frame from that, but instead maybe I get one ugly frame, you know, where it was transitioning, I wasn't holding as still as I should. It's quite good. The image stabilization is amazing. And it can key the image stabilization to wherever your focus point is on the sensor. So it's not like most in-body image stabilization and like all Nikon in-body image stabilization keyed to the center of the sensor, it can go wherever your focus point goes and focus the in-body image stabilization on that point. That's a first, pretty amazing. Manual focus eye detect or subject detection, whether it's animals, people, or vehicles, it can pick up a subject while you're in manual focus mode. And you can choose whether that's frame wide or wide area large limited or wide area small limited. It'll pick up those eyes, it'll pick up those faces, it'll pick up those vehicles, it'll track them. And as you manually focus a lens like this Voigtlander 51.0 or like my old Nikon 105 2.5 from decades ago, when you get it focused, the square that's tracking that subject will go green so you know you've manually focused it. And if you program the OK button like I like to do to zoom into 100% instead of resetting the focus point, I'll show you how to do that in my setup video. You hit the OK button while it's tracking an eye or a vehicle, boom, it zooms into the eye, tracks the eye as you fine tune the focus, looking at it at 100% through the viewfinder. That's just crazy. That made me, the minute I read about that before I ever got this camera in my hand, I immediately ordered, reordered the Voigtlander knocked on 51.0 uh, because I loved this lens. It was just difficult to focus. It was better on the Z9 than it was on the Z6 II. On this camera, it's a dream. You know, I, I see someone's eye, I focus it in manually, I see the light go green, I shoot, I hit OK, Woo! all of a sudden all I see is the eye, I focus it perfectly, fire, and it jump, the minute I hit the shutter button, it jumps back out and I can recompose as I'm shooting. Boop, boop, boop. I'm getting so many razor sharp shots with people's eye razor sharp with this 1.0 lens wide open. Crazy. Super cool. Plus, you know, if you throw a, an older F-mount lens on the FTZ adapter, it works great. Its autofocus is just fine with all of the modern Z-glass or the F-glass is designed to go with the FTZ adapter like this 105 1.4 that I love so much. You know, I worked with this camera, with the Plena, with all of my lenses in Scotland. I didn't take another camera except the, Le the Leica Q3 with me to Scotland, and I loved using it. 
I love the dedicated black and white mode. It's got a lever here that you flip. I forgot to mention that when I was talking about the controls. Between, it's outside the shutter speed dial. There's a little lever, and when you flip it, you go from video to stills to black and white. And it has three different black and white profiles. One is low contrast, one is normal, one is high contrast. I like the normal. Whichever one you were in last, that's what it flips you into. The last black and white profile active is keyed to that black and white mode on the switch. And all of a sudden, your viewfinder and your images are in black and white profile. And if you shoot black and white raw files, you still have all the color data in there, but when you bring them into Lightroom, it'll activate that black and white profile and it will look like it looked like in camera as you shot it. It's fabulous. The true flip screen, I love that. I know some people don't. The biggest thing I love about it, one, with this camera, it completes the retro look when it's closed. Two, it protects the screen. I'm not damaging the screen. When it's the things bouncing up against my side and rough trails and things like that or surrounding my bag, it's nice to have that screen hidden. You know, I can always deploy it. I also, like I said, you know, I can be out shooting and I can have, it's so easy to position wherever I want while I'm working. I love that. You know, it's not so much about the selfie mode for me, it's about just the flexibility of using that thing. And I'll show you when I get to accessories how it works with my chosen L bracket system. Oh, 3D area with subject detect. This has the same processor as the Z9 and the Z8. It's fast and it has 3D area subject detection and it does all the wildlife and animals just like the Z8 or the Z9. It's, it's a wonderful focusing machine and that 3D detect lets you point it to which of the subjects is important and it'll look for that subject's head, eyes, torso. Um, insane low light autofocus. Just insane low light autofocus. Now, the Z8, the Z9, the Z62, I can focus a star in the dark, so what improvements needed, but this camera even improves upon those and its low light capability. Um, crazy, and it has the starlight view and the red overlay view so that you can not burn your night vision out. Everything's displayed on the camera in low intensity red to save your night vision. And you can compose scenes in Milky Way shooting conditions using the starlight view. So all the same kind of benefits that you get in the Z8 or the Z9 with the insane low light sensor from the Z6 and the Z62. And that second base ISO level of 800, which improves everything doing Milky Way and, star and, and night work. Uh, and finally, the fact that they even went to the level of detail of making these dials, the exposure compensation dial, the shutter dial, and the ISO dial out of brass, so that as this camera wears and ages, the brass will get exposed and it's going to shine gold through, which is one of my reasons for choosing a gold, a brass colored soft touch button um, to begin with. All right, so those are my pros and cons. I'm going to walk you through, oh, the other one is pixel shift shooting. Now, granted, it's only a 24 megapixel camera, but you have the ability to composite either 4, 8, 16, or 32 images into a single image at either the base resolution for the 4 and the 8 images, which can either just sample the colors from each pixel site instead of only red, green, or blue, or do that plus do some, some stacking like night photography where it reduces noise and improves image quality. That's the 4 or the 8. The 16 does the same thing with the sampling the same color pixels. You know, every color gets sampled at every photoreceptor site, but it also shifts the sensor around almost as if you were doing a, a panorama to create a 96 megapixel image from the same sensor. And 32 images does the same thing plus the stacking to just improve image quality and reduce noise. It works really quite well if you're on the tripod with subjects that aren't moving. And I'll show you that along with some other stuff in a quick image review right now. We'll just jump over on my desktop and I'll run through some of my images that I've captured with this that highlight its capabilities. All right, so I'm here in Lightroom Classic with some images out of the ZF from this first month that I've had it. I was off in Scotland and I wound up putting about 2,500 images through it. I thought I'd showcase you know, some of the capabilities of its pixel shift shooting, its autofocus, its insane uh, image stabilization, and just the black and white mode and, and the results that you can get you know, with beautiful manual focus lenses like this 51.0 from Voigtlander, which I've had a really hard time 
taking off the camera. That ability to, to have it detect an eye and automatically zoom in on that eye as you perfect manual focus, track it, and then to be able to take that shot with just a perfect manually focused eye is a whole new kind of thing. Now, I basically got this camera in the mail the day before uh, I took off for Scotland. And I had a hard time while I was out in Scotland in, in the fall taking that lens off the camera. Obviously, I, I did shoot a fair bit with the Plena and with the other lenses that I have with me. But uh, I just love working with the, the manual focus lens with the manual aperture ring and that manual, you know, eye detect autofocus. Um, in this case, you know, I just zoomed in on the tree, perfected focus on the bark, shot at f1.0 just to get this kind of dreamy look on this back road in the rain. Working at night in the streets, you know, with that wide aperture and that normal lens, just let me let me work with faster shutter speeds and lower ISOs, and still make sure I was perfecting focus. And I just love the rendering in the black and white mode. This is basically, you know, a raw file, almost just straight out of the camera. I did do a little noise uh, reduction um, in in Lightroom. I used its denoise. Here's here's Rick in this uh, restaurant that we were at. I was talking about how the eye, defo eye detect kind of um, you know assist the 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 eye detect manual eye, uh, auto or the eye detect manual focus worked. And he's like, "Let me see it." And he's like, "Wow, dang, that changes the usability of these lenses and older lenses in a fascinating way." I think all these shots so far with the 51.0, you can you can see what they are up there. But some of my favorite images: this amazing old cemetery and in church graveyard where there was you know some of the the gravestones were so old there was no inscription left on them, and they looked the same on both sides. And there with David and Charlie and Rick, uh, you know, and just the ability to get that shallow depth of field and yet nail your focus, which is you know. It knows your subject, you zoom in, I zoomed in on Rick's eye, and it's just, just so much fun. Here's the Naya Evo uh, team. You got Jensen and Mario there on the west side of the Isle of Sky. You know, just having it with me all the time, whether you're in coffee shops or out in the landscape, you know, getting that subject background, deck, you know, just just uh, separation with that 50 at 1.0. I was using a little neutral density here to even shoot it at 1.0 in a bright sunny day. I did, you know, it's not just for that 51.0 though. This is that old 105 2.5 AIS manual focus Nikon lens that I used 20 years ago and it's been sitting on a shelf because it's just such a beautiful lens and slapping it on with the FTZ adapter Shooting my, my little girl Pepper at uh, f2.5. Pretty darn awesome to see that lens come back to life. And, you know, it still gives you that eye detect autofocus. Pretty darn cool. And, of course, it's working just as well with your legendary Nikon Z lenses like the 14 to 24S. Here I am with David Archer. We just saw this beautiful light in the hills. And it's like, stop the car. Out shooting, you know, beautiful. And, you know, I was around town shooting in, in Portree in Scotland and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of walking around the docks and I have my, uh, my 24 to 120 on and a seagull comes flying by. I was whipped out to 120 and instantly just fired off a few frames and it did the bird detect eye, defo eye detect focus just as well as the Z9 or the, the Z8. You know, it's got that same processor and whether you're using wide area or auto area, or a 3D detection mode, it's gonna pick up eyes and subjects and animals and vehicles and all those things those other cameras can. So you get that modern uh, autofocus. I guess one of the things that's just a bit of a shocker to me, honestly, is, is the ability of this camera to, to shoot with really slow shutter speeds with that insane, eight stops of in-body image stabilization. So here I am at 61 millimeters shooting at a half a second handheld. Um, you know, zooming this into 100%. Let's see, am I at 100%? Yeah, it's just a big 4K screen. I mean, look at that. That's sharp. <laughs> I mean, half a second handheld. Look at the water. That's crazy. This was just the other day at Silver Falls State Park. I think I'm still zoomed into 100% here. Yep, this is with my 105 1.4. Uh, an autofocus lens, 
you know, F8, quarter of a second at 105. And it's nuts. I tried a half and it was a bit blurry, but a quarter of a second with a 105 F mount lens, crazy. You know, back to the 24 to 120 Z lens, it's 31.5 millimeters, a little wider angle, half a second. Look how sharp we're talking about this being. You know, there's a little wind potentially, but the rocks and the grasses, it's just crazy. All of these handheld. You know, here we are at, again, 64 millimeters. I think I just showed a shot like that of the same waterfall. I shot a whole bunch of frames, you know, not 100% sure they were going to be sharp. Here we are at 75 millimeters at a half a second. Yeah, I guess you get the idea. I would fire in burst mode like I was used to trying to hold really steady. I was, I was being careful with my technique, but, but still, I mean, as I go and look through them, they're basically all sharp. You know, maybe there's one or two that aren't sharp. That's the opposite of what you'd expect with a much faster shutter speed than this. So, I mean, I'm not saying it makes a tripod useless, but it, it definitely changes how I think think about photographing slower shutter speeds where I want to blur motion and hold the rest of the world still. It's just crazy what it's capable of. So let's talk really briefly about its uh, ability to do this pixel shift shooting. I, I, I did a couple of different pixel shift, shift shots since I've had it that seemed, you know, well built for. You don't want to do that with fast moving subjects, you know, flowing water, that kind of thing. But this cityscape, the white lights are twinkling a bit, the Space Needle, I was there with my family. You know, if I zoom in to 100%, let me bring my left panel in here in Lightroom. If I, if I click on that, it'll lock it in. I'm at 100% here. What if I zoomed in to, to 300%? That would be sort of the equivalent of taking 24 megapixels up to 48 and then 96. So, you know, zooming into 300%, having a look at how it renders if, you know, you were trying to get the equivalent of 96 megapixels. It's, it's not beautiful. Um, it's pretty blurry. You know, you're taking 24 and, and multiplying it three times. Sure, you could use some up-res software. Um, but let's have a look at the same image shot NEFX, pixel shift shooting. I'll do a video really soon about how to process these. It's very simple. It's just a step you would do before you bring the images in uh, to your editor of choice. But we, oh, I'm still at 300. Better, but let's go to just 100%. So that's about the equivalent that's 96 megapixels. Look at that. Um, I'm impressed. This was shot with 32 frames, so it's sampling uh, every pixel in the camera with eat red, green, and blue, and then blending, you know, shifting the pixels just slightly and building a 96 megapixel image from a 24 megapixel sensor. That's pretty nuts. Okay, again, you know, let's just look at that one more time. What was it like? taking the regular frame up to the equivalent of about 96 mega, that just doesn't look the same. All right, so, you know, 100% versus 100%, wow. That's a pretty major change. Definitely for those of you who like to print, it's kind of equivalent to shooting a multi-frame pano to get more resolution if the conditions are right, things aren't moving. You know, here, here's one more. This is really the first one that I did. This is on the Isle of Skye in Scotland. Uh, and you know, zooming into that 100% resolution, pretty darned awesome um, in the right circumstance. So, image quality, really, really astounding, and some of those new capabilities are awesome. All right, so let's talk really briefly about, uh, well, we'll talk about briefly about each of these accessories that I think are just critical. So when Nikon designed this, I'm sure people at Nikon were like, this grip is too small if you're using bigger lenses. And by bigger lenses, I mean even this heavy Voigtlander 51.0. It's not a light lens. And having this little bump for a grip isn't a secure feeling walking around with this camera if it's not tethered to you. And so they probably jumped on the fastest producer of aftermarket gear that they know of, which is small rig and gave them the specs and details in a sample camera. And Small Rig designed this Arca Swiss plate that has a port for the battery that's easy access to your battery and memory cards and threads right into the base of here and provides a nice big grip that's just as good to me as the Z62 or Z72's grip or the Z8's grip. It's really comfortable. It gives me a secure feeling walking around with this camera without any kind of a strap on it. Um, it doesn't have a QD port, it's 
sadly, and it isn't an L bracket, but I have a little bit of a solution for that as well. Really Right Stuff just released this universal L bracket, and I've been quite impressed with it. It fits my, my, um, my Leica Q3 quite well, although I prefer Really Right Stuff's grip L bracket, which I, I've modified mine for the Q2, and it works well, and I know they're coming out. They are coming out with one for the Q3. But Really Right Stuff came out with this universal one, and it does have a QD port so that I can plug my favorite strap from Luma into it. And it, it does kind of a cool thing. You loosen up this one piece, and the whole outer you know, vertical rail slides out to expose two more screws underneath. And the first of those two screws has got this built-in Allen wrench that clips into the L bracket. The first one lets you slide this base plate that goes on the camera with an anti-twist plate forward and aft. And I think for the ZF with the small rig grip attached, you want it all the way as far pushed forward as possible, plus five millimeters is where it goes. And then you torque that guy down, you can tighten it that way and then just give it a little twist. This L bracket is, is, is light and I don't think you wanna over tighten these screws. You just wanna give it a little snugging. Then you're gonna leave this slider part loose and if you put it in the furthest, furthest screw hole on the small rig base plate away from the battery, that's gonna to continue to give you battery access. And you just put that little anti-twist plate up against small rigs, Arca Swiss dovetail, put that screw in the slot, keep them both sort of positioned as you snug that bolt in using the long part of the Allen wrench and keep it pressed tight so that the anti-twist plate is engaged on that Arca dovetail, and then give that a little bit of a snug, not too much. Then you can slide this plate in, and the end plate of this moves forward and aft towards the lens or back towards the viewfinder by three millimeters in either direction, so six millimeters total play. And that's designed to allow you to have access to the ports on the side of your camera. I prefer to move it forward, which makes it harder to access the ports on this camera, but I'll show you why in one second. I'm gonna hold it back, Give it a little snugging. It doesn't need to be too monster tight. There it is. We got an L bracket that's nice and securely fastened. It's lightweight, looks designed for the camera, fits snug, and it still allows me to bring that screen out, flip it around, still have selfie mode, still use it above my head, still use it below. I still have full access to that thing and can close it. That's why I move it forward. If I want access to my ports, I don't have to take the whole thing off, I just loosen that, pull that out, and I have very easy access to all the ports, which you almost are never gonna do in a vertical position anyway. So there you go. Nice and simple. Maybe for using uh, power delivery battery, if you're shooting vertical at night, I think it's slide it out, leave it slid out, still connect and be solidly connected. Speaking of which, I think a power delivery capable battery bank is a great thing to have with a camera like this that can charge its battery while you're using it as long as you have a power delivery. It has to be marked PD. I love these Anchor 20,000 milliamp bat, uh, battery packs. You can charge the camera a couple times. You can run all night doing Milky Way work with the LCD on with this plugged into the camera. And it has a second port to run a lens warmer if you need it if you're in that kind of weather conditions. So that's an accessory I highly recommend. Again, all these accessories are linked in this video's full description or over at my ATS Links website. I think the Bluetooth remote control for this camera is really nice, you know, particularly if you're doing longer exposures uh, where blur could be a factor. You can down in that tenth of a second to you know five seconds where shaking the camera by pushing the shutter matters. You know, having a little remote activation is great. Plus there's other uses where it's just really nice to have. And it's Bluetooth and has pretty good range. Once you connect, it's really well connected. Again, spare batteries. Thankfully, most of us have these laying around from all the other Nikon batteries we've used. I think having some retro lenses are nice. I'm not a huge fan. I mean, I, I like this Nikon 28 2.8. It's a nice little lens. It looks retro styled. It looks nice on this camera, but it has no aperture ring for that third level of control. I love some of Voigtlander's lenses. I like the 40, uh, I think it's a 40 1.4 or 1.2 is a great lens. But this 50 1.0 Nocton is super, super special. I'll take this lens over the Nikon Noct, the, the, the 58.95. Um, this lens 
has a special character, a special feel. It's wonderful to focus with. The aperture ring on the front feels precise and wonderful. The focusing is great and accurate. Um, and it's a dream combination on this camera. I absolutely adore it. I loved this when I, when I tested it last summer and did a video about it. I'm linking that video right here. Um, but I love it even more on this camera with the manual focus subject detection and ability to zoom in on eyes so easily. It's pretty darned fantastic. I'll put that Allen wrench back in the, in the holder. I think that uh, having good quality SD cards for shooting in burst modes and good quality micro SD cards for this are pretty critical. I'm using uh, a Lexar Pro uh, Gold card. They're 300 megabytes per second read speed, 260 megabytes per second write speed. Now granted, that's not competing in the slightest with the, um, with the CF Express B cards that I use in my Nikon Z9, but it's fast enough for this camera. You know, again, you're not going to be shooting 300 frames at 30 frames a second with this camera. It won't do it. It's more of a 9, 10 frame a second camera. Um, but it's more than sufficient for the stills and video work that you're likely to do with the camera with this intention. Um, and I've been blown away by Lexar's micro SD cards. They sent those, these to me to test, and I've been really impressed with both the gold and silver uh, pro micro SD cards. The gold shoots at 280 megabytes, uh, reads at 280 megabytes a second and writes at 180 megabytes a second. And the silver, which I have in here, I have a one terabyte silver micro SD card in here, uh, reads at 160 megabytes per second and writes at a not that much slower 130 megabytes per second. So you go from 130 to 180 with the gold. Um, the gold is definitely a faster reading card when you're bringing images and video off of the camera. But the silver, I've tested it, and it was good at 10-bit, 4K, 30 frames a second, good at, which is the full FX sensor read. Um, it crops down to DX mode to do 4K uh, 60, and I tried that. I tried it all both in 10-bit standard definition, in hyperlog gamut, in Nikon N-log. It can handle any video this can shoot, including the silver micro SD card. So, Suddenly, if you're using this at all for video, that micro SD card slot can be a savior. It, it, it really soaks up all that video data and leaves your SD card free for you to do the, the shooting of stills and high-speed shooting that you need to do. So if this camera shot 8K, it might not be capable, but it does beautiful 4K video, beautiful 4K video. I really never shoot 8K video, um, and it does everything I need it to do for video on micro SD. So having that second slot is actually handy, and I'll link those cards along with the other accessories. Um, as I said, you know, I love my Luma strap for all my cameras, particularly for this camera and that really right stuff, universal L-bracket gives me the QD connection port that lets me plug my favorite strap from Luma Labs right into that. And then, you know, finally, uh, filters, I'm going to pull my, my little uh, case MCUV filter off there. I spin this, um, it's a 50, which one is it? I think this particular lens is 62. It's a 62 millimeter filter thread. So I have my 62 to 82 millimeter adapter and then my case 82 millimeter filters fit it really beautifully. Silver Revolution filter is the polarizer. It just spins on the magnetic mount nice and thin. And I've got the color coded, you know, three, six, and 10 stop neutral density filters. They just lock in there. And I love the fact that they take a standard 82 millimeter cap. So it's as easy to remove the cap as just pinching it. All of a sudden the pinch caps off without removing the filter as well. So you can stack and match at will with cases 82 millimeter filters. Perfect blend for this camera. So there you have it. Um, those are the accessories that I've been using with it. I think that the grip from small rig is absolutely essential if you're gonna enjoy holding this camera and have a secure feel with it. Um, I think that Really Right Stuff's L-bracket pairs with that quite nicely if you're gonna do vertical tripod mounted work. Um, and also gives you the QD port that's nice to have. Um, so that's a great thing to throw on there. I think that the micro SD cards, you'd be surprised how fast they've gotten. Um, and these Lexar ones, 
have been great. Also, the Lexar Gold SD card I'm using, it's nice and fast, and it's been great. Hasn't it, It's given me everything I need with this camera. So, you know, I know there are those, I said I would talk a little bit about the people who are discontented with this camera. I have some friends, I, I won't name names, who've voiced real um, dissatisfaction that Nikon brought this out instead of a Z62 and Z72, I or three and seven three, and I am absolutely certain they are working on those cameras, and they will both be higher megapixel. Um, you know, I can't, I don't have any crystal ball, but that's what it seems to me has to be happening. And they'll have the faster processing, and they'll have the 3D detection, and they'll have a lot of the cool new features that they've showcased in this camera. I'm sure the Z6 III will be in the 30-some megapixel range. I'm betting the Z7 goes in the 60-plus megapixel range to compete with the competitors that are out there. Um, this camera is just different. You know, if, if you really don't like dials and controls, this camera is, you know, still can be, can be operated the same way, but it may not feel like what you want. If you want the one camera to rule it all, if the Z6 II is your camera and you really want an update, or you holding on to a Z6, and you really want something that pushes that envelope to a new space, and you see all the features integrated in this, and you're like, I don't want to have to buy an accessory grip and put the wheels into command dial mode uh, and deal with the same sensor as the Z6 II. Well, you know, the wait is going to be just a little bit longer. Um, so I understand that. For those who don't feel uh, compelled to work with an old school system of dials. I love it. I love the dials. I love the aperture wheel on this lens. It just puts me in a contemplative mood, in a creative mood, shooting with these controls over pressing a button down and turning a dial. I love it. I love the tactile feel, and I love the way this feels in my hand, and I love the way it looks sitting on the desk. So there's that. Um, you know. I, I, I'm sure Nikon will be coming out with the cameras that you're all waiting for. It's just obviously going to be not this year. Um, so just stay tuned for all that. And of course, I can't wait to get them in my hands and test them when they get here. But for right now, for those like me, this little guy is pretty sweet. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you're all staying safe, staying creative, enjoying holiday season, good food, family time. And uh, we'll see you next week.